Hey, Diane. That's it. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all well. <laughs> so, yeah, as Diane said, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute at the World Futures Forum and Next Potential University, which is actually going to launch in about six months' time and is going to be one of the world's first virtual reality universities. Now, I open source all of my futurist content. I look over the next 50 years. And particularly when we sort of start to having a conversation about this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about what I call the future of exponential innovation, which hopefully is something that you're all interested in. So consider this. Innovation itself is being disrupted. Now, we increasingly talk about the concept of centaurs and machines. Now, for all of those that you don't know, a centaur is a person who is able to use technology and different tools to improve the things that they do. So it actually came from Gary Kasparov, who got beaten by Deep Blue. So Gary Kasparov was a chess champion. He got beaten comprehensively by an artificial intelligence. And when everyone said to him, well, you know, it's got to really suck that you just got beaten as the world expert by an artificial intelligence. He actually said, no, it taught me new things. So as we start having a look at the future, we have this unison incoming between machines and humans. And there's a lot of benefits in that, which I'll walk through. Now, when we actually have a look at innovation itself, I often say, I often say that innovation itself is actually being disrupted. And innovation itself needs reinventing. And at the end of this presentation, you will see why we need to reinvent tomorrow's innovation framework. So uh, Julie's going to make available these three books of mine. So we've got How to Build Exponential Enterprises. We've got a trends codex. There are over 150 mega trends in there. And we've got exponential technologies as well. So we have about 250 exponential technologies detailed in these codexes here, which, as Joel said, when we start thinking about the products that we're going to build in the future, it's not about individual technologies. It's about how you combine them together to create a smartphone, a semiconductor, whatever it is that we're looking to do. Now, also consider this. You are the most powerful version of yourself that has ever lived. As an individual, you can have an idea today. You can push it into, say, social media. So that's how you launch it. You, that gives you access to around three and a half billion people on the planet, which then brings us back to this. As an individual, your power to affect change at a global scale and change the lives of billions of people faster than you ever could have in the past is now on steroids. But of course, when we, when we actually have a look at the foundations of innovation, you still need three things at a very high level. Firstly, you need an organization that fosters innovation, or you need an inquisitive mind if you're an individual or an individual entrepreneur. So in that particular part of the triangle, we're trying to find problems worth solving. Then we move to the right-hand side of the triangle, how to solve those problems. That's generally technology and tools and how we combine them together to create our next generation products and services. And then the last thing is we have our brand new thing that can change the world, but we need to get it into the market. And that's investment, liability, it's accessibility, affordability, regulations, it's culture, cultural bias, cultural alignment, geopolitics, and all these other things that really matter when we talk about getting things into the market. So that execution piece. Now, when we start talking as well, basically about the speed of change, it took 75 years for 50 million people to adopt the television. It took 19 days for 50 million people to adopt Pokemon Go. It took six days for 100 million people to adopt Call of Duty. And if we actually have a look at Facebook Libra, Facebook Libra was unique. It's a cryptocurrency developed by Facebook in June 2019. In the words of the chairman of the People's Bank of China, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve, if Libra had been approved and regulated, then it could have changed the global financial services system, the state control of money, and the global financial services industry overnight. Because Mark Zuckerberg could have pushed his cryptocurrency into Facebook, and 12 hours later, 500 million people or more could be using it. So we live in times of extreme speed and extreme, extreme change. Now, I track over 450 exponential technologies. 
There are 180 of them on this starburst, and this is in the codex that Julie's going to be sending out. Every single technology on this starburst either has the ability to change one industry or every industry. The starburst goes for the next 50 years. Each individual dot is worth about half a trillion dollars when it comes to addressable market opportunities. And I'm not going to go through these, but just to give you a brief glimpse, 3D printing, for example, disrupts the $10 trillion manufacturing industry. 5G disrupts the communications industry. High and low Earth orbit satellites also disrupts the global communications industry and connects the other three and a half billion people on the planet. When we start looking at computing, we already have quantum computers coming through, neuromorphic computers coming through, DNA and biological computers coming through. When we start talking about materials and energy, in the energy space, we have a way to create solar panels that are 132% energy efficient. We can beam solar from space. We've already done that with the US military. When we start looking at things like robotics, basically we have hard robots, soft robots. We have molecular robots and DNA-based robots that have created the world's first molecular assemblers. There is a whole world of opportunity out there for you all. And when we start talking about the products and services that we can create, the vast majority of them are increasingly looking like science fiction. For example, we've already created DNA-based artificial intelligences and AIs that you can 3D print. That's a conversation for another time. Now, what we do with all these different technologies is interesting as well. Every industry is being disrupted. So if we use a bioreactor, we can take the stem cell or a cell from a feather in a chicken we can put it into a bioreactor, we can grow chicken nuggets, and those chicken nuggets can go on sale as they are in Singapore. We can create vertical farms that use 100% less potable water than traditional farms, 100% fewer pesticides and chemicals than traditional farms, but produce eight times the crop yields and in, do it in an organic way. So that solves global famine, by the way. On the energy side of things, we have a trillion watts of renewable energy installed. We already have solar panels that are 17 to 20 percent energy efficient, but we have bacterial solar panels coming out of China that are 50 percent energy efficient. If you put carbon nanotubes into a solar panel, you get 80 percent. And if you 3D print a new nanophotonic material, you get something called black silicon, which is 132 percent energy efficient. The world of energy is being transformed, and that's before we discuss hydrogen, ammonia, and all these other sort of technologies that are coming through. The world of finance, decentralized finance, fintechs, robo-wealth advisors. When we have a look at healthcare, we already have technologies like CRISPR, a gene editing tool that we can put into your body. It can clip out a fake gene, it can clip out a faulty gene, clip in a new gene, and in one patient's case in America, who had an inherited genetic disease, he no longer has the inherited genetic disease. That one technology alone helps us cure 6,000 incurable genetic diseases. And that's before I talk about being able to 3D print human organs like human hearts as we have in Israel, bones, skin, tissue, corneas, cartilage, livers, kidneys, brain tissue, and all other things. And then finally, transportation. Every industry is being disrupted, but this is a snapshot. In the transportation industry, everything is going autonomous and electric. And then in the construction industry, when we look at 3D printing, we apply 3D printing to the construction industry, and we can do this on Earth, or we can do this on Mars. <laughs>
That technology disrupts the construction industry. It allows you to 3D print buildings 95% faster, 95% cheaper than anything else that we can do today. Now, when we start having a look at innovation itself, and we're pretty much getting to the end, exponential innovation, we already have artificial intelligences. I call them creative machines that are able to design and innovate new products. Now, when you start combining these and other technologies together, you can do this. You can have a product that designs itself. You can then have that product 3D printed on demand, which then means we cut the time to go from con product concept to shelf by up to 99%. And I have examples. So this is an, exa this is an example of the world's first self-evolving, self-printing 3D robot. And it's a good example of where the future of innovation is going, particularly when we start talking about continuous innovation. So this is a sausage robot from the University of Oslo in Norway. The researchers wanted it to get from one side of the room to the other. That was the goal, that was their innovation goal. So what they did is they created the first version of the robot, put sensors into it. Those sensors, as the robot moves from one side of the floor to the other, feed information back to an artificial intelligence that then tries to design a faster robot. And it does it in virtual simulation. So the artificial intelligence runs through thousands of simulations a minute to try to find a better design for robot version number one. It finds one, it creates a wireframe, and those wireframes are then sent to 3D printers. And in this particular example, the 3D printer, 3D printed parts are then assembled by a lab technician. But at MIT three years ago, using a 4D printer, we 4D printed a robot that walked off the printer itself. And then it could just repeat the cycle. This single video here is a prime example of how we are using different technology combinations to accelerate the rate of innovation by tens or even hundreds of thousands fold. And in the next video that I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how we accelerate the rate of innovation by millions fold, and in one example, billions fold. And here's the new robot. And it goes off and does its thing. But you can apply that same principle to any product. You can put sensors into a vehicle, the vehicle travels around a city, sends information on its usage based back to a creative artificial intelligence and as in General Motors case the AI designs a better car faster. This is the design of the world's most dexterous robot hand which was done in weeks with 800 years worth of training. We try to build robots that learn a little bit like humans do by trial and error. What we've done is trained an algorithm to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed with a robotic hand. Which is actually pretty hard even for a human to do. We don't tell it how the hand needs to move the, the cube in order to get there. The particular friction that's on the fingers, how easy it is to turn the faces on the cube, what the gravity, what the weight of the cube is, all of these things it needs to learn by itself. The interesting thing is that kind of standard techniques in robotics haven't been able to scale to that complexity that we see in a robotic hand. Humans have evolved to be able to manipulate and operate our hands. So there's a huge amount of learning that's happened through evolution to get us to this point as a, as a species. And the robot has to learn all of this from scratch instead of trying to write very dedicated algorithms to operate such a hand, we took a different approach where we create thousands of different simulated environments and learn to do the task in all of those. And hopefully a robotic hand will be able to do it in the real world as well. This means like thousands of years of experience that this neural network has had in simulation. Every time the algorithm has gotten good at the task, we make the task harder. 
that's really crucial because it needs exposure to really complicated environments in order to eventually be robust to the real world. So what we're doing is we are automating the art of innovation. And the way that we automate it is innovation, as any innovation expert will tell you, is a process. If I asked you to take the cup in front of you and make it half the weight, in your mind you're going through a process. You can make it out of different materials, cut it in half, you can do all manner of different things. Some things work, some things don't. But for an artificial intelligence to start creating new products, it needs to understand the concept of what you're talking about. Create a cup that is half as heavy. It then needs to understand the use case of those products. It then needs to feed off of material databases, laws and physics engines, laws of nature engines, all these other things. And then at some point, basically, we end up with AIs that move from iterative innovation, as we see today, to primary and disruptive innovation. And in terms of finding problems to solve, these artificial intelligences can learn from big data. They can scan Twitter, see what everyone's complaining about, and go, maybe this is something to solve, and then start innovating and iterating. But when you start combining these engines with humans, the central principle, then we really get some exciting things going. And as for what these machines are already innovating, they are innovating the latest Airbus A330neo, which Airbus think is going to be up to 20% lighter. They are innovating new pharmaceutical drugs. Within Silico, in Silico used the creative artificial intelligence to design 21,000 new drugs in three weeks. That's unheard of. Even the COVID vaccine basically should have normally taken five to 10 years to develop. It actually took, using some of these technologies, actually took about two months, with human trials then taking six to seven months. We have NASA, who are now designing all of their future lunar rovers using these technologies, because these technologies also design new products with the least amount of material, which helps sustainability. And we have companies like Under Armour, an Under Armour creative artificial intelligence designed a completely new sneaker called the Architect Day One. It was 3D printed day two. And in Under Armour's case, it normally takes them 18 months to go from product concept to product on the shelf. And it's not just hardware or software products. We have these machines that are now developing new artificial intelligence chipsets with companies like Google. They're developing new software. They're even developing new artificial intelligences called child AIs. And they're also creating new forms of content. We have artificial intelligences creating music, book, books, virtual reality games, all manner of different things. Podcasts, procedural content, you name it. So when we talk about the future of innovation, it's changing. It's getting faster. When we talk about the things that we can actually make as innovators, they're increasingly becoming science fiction and disrupting every single corner of global society, business, and culture. And as for me, that's it. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you got it got you thinking. Thank you very much for listening and uh, goodbye.